Hello, welcome to Take Time Thursday. Today's subject is approaching difficult conversations with youth and each other. This workshop will guide participants on healthy and smart ways to start conversations surrounding timely and important national topics in easy and practical ways. We didn't wanna leave anyone out, so it also addresses inclusive themes and is helpful to approach difficult subjects also with other adults. So we encourage you to take notes as we are on pins and needles as to what to say to each other these days. Um, today's speaker is Laniqua Dominique Jenkins. In June of 2020, Ms. Jenkins self-published a children's book titled Mira Mira on the Wall. This book celebrates melanin and promotes po body positivity. As you turn each page, young readers will fall more deeply in love with all body types, skin tones, and learn to challenge beauty standards outside of Western <laughs> cultural norms. Additionally, this book is a great resource to develop self-esteem, confidence, and self-awareness, particularly for Black and Brown children. Laniqua Dominique Jenkins has earned a bachelor's degree in political science and pre-law. Her concentration was in international human rights, and she minored in African-American studies from the University of Houston. In 2015, she was elected as an ANC commissioner in Washington, D.C. During her time in office, her focus was on creating equitable communities and prioritizing people over profit. She has several years of international internship and policy work experience in Africa, India, and Spain. She is formally trained in several languages, such as Hindi, Shang, Spanish, Twi, and English. Take Time Thursdays with the Anacost Museum gives participants a chance to take time for health, wellness, and creativity with artists, thought leaders, performers, wellness practitioners, and others. We're asking people to take just a 30-minute break with us on, on certain Thursdays, not each week now, from 2.30 to 3 p.m. and boost your mind, body, and spirit. I'm Janelle Cooper, and I am an educator at the Smithsonian's Anacostia Community Museum. I will now turn the program over to our guest presenter, Laniqua Dominique. Welcome, Laniqua. Hi, welcome, welcome, and thank you for that beautiful introduction. Hi, everyone. I'm really excited that you guys are here with me today. I'm going to share my screen, so give me a few moments to do so. As you know, my name is Laniqua Dominique Jenkins. I'm excited to be here. I know that you guys have an enormous amount of choice um, in a small amount of time, so I don't take it lightly. Today, we will be talking about how to approach difficult conversations with youth and each other. I wanna start by kind of opening up with a question. Like what age really is the appropriate age to kind of talk about heavy topics like racism, colorism, privilege? I mean, infancy, does that sound bizarre? Maybe three, maybe four, maybe seven. Statistics show that most people think that you should start talking about race around the age of five. But honestly, that's incredibly delayed to have such a heavy and girthy conversation. At birth, babies look equally at faces of all races. By three months, babies start to look more at the faces that match their caregivers. By one, or as young as two years old, children use race to reason about people's behaviors. By 30, months, by 30 months, most children use race to choose playmates. By three, expressions of racial prejudice or evidence often start to peak. By kindergarten, children show many of the same racial attitudes that adults in our culture hold. They have already learned to associate some groups with higher status than others. They've already started to create inferior and superior types of relationships amongst people based off exclusively skin color. I know you're probably thinking, oh my gosh, you mean to tell me that a young person can identify race at infancy? 
they're already making adult and informed conclusions by five? Absolutely. And what are you supposed to do with all of this information? How can you navigate this? One of the easy ways to do this is by liberating your bookshelves. Liberate your bookshelves by including books that have major characters projected positively that are in marginalized communities or in black and brown communities. Make sure that your books are inclusive, diverse, and affirming. And today I'm going to be using my book, Mirror, Mirror on the Wall, as a compass and a tool to help us navigate really heavy conversations as a case study. I want us all to look at this image. Pay really close attention to the details, the characters, and the language. Start by reading the language in your mind as I read it aloud. Oh no, little king, no need to be fair. Your skin produces melanin, and that's unique, special, and rare. Right now, I'm challenging all of you to be honest about your observations, check in with your inexplicit biases, and make a mental note of what you see and what quickly comes to mind. Let's unpack those observations. I'm sure that from the title of the book, Mirror, Mirror on the Wall, you were able to make that literary connection to Snow White. In the Disney movie, Snow White, the character desires to be the fairest in the land. That speaks to whiteness and its proximity to beauty and Western standards of beauty. It was very important for me to have the illustrator center a person of darker hue, to center blackness and make it a focal point. I want you to really think about the language. This would be an opportunity to guide your young reader with a vocabulary lesson regarding melanin. Look at the characters playing in the sun. This would be an opportunity to talk about colorism and pigmentocracies and how that influences relationships. One thing that you could also do is have a layered learning exercise. If you ever check out the book in the back, there are three different modalities that can be engaged. There is a there's a glossary that has the language, there's a drawing activity, and there's an application where you get to make sentences. So you get to apply all different learning styles, audio, kinesthetic, and visual. Let's try that exercise one more time. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Do Black Lives Matter or are we destined to fall? Really lean into what you see. Be honest about your thoughts. Don't be embarrassed by your inexplicit biases and really check in with yourself. Let's talk about the observations that we made. Now this page in particular, I really, really like it. I like it because it's very scalable. You can look at the language of Black Lives Matter and you can make it very political, capital BLM, or you can prioritize and center the black and brown experience by the language of Black Lives Matter. Don't be afraid to explicitly talk about race. This would be a very opportune time to talk about skin color and diversity. Also, don't be afraid to talk about privilege. We've already discussed that by age three, kids can already clearly understand what it means to experience privilege, meaning how some people can have opportunities exclusively based off of physical attributes and others don't. Maybe you could ask some questions to kind of see what headspace your young person is in. You could ask a question like, who would make a good friend? And maybe that young reader would say something like, I think Jimmy on the right would make a really bad friend. And you would say, well, why do you think Jimmy would make a bad friend? And maybe you get the response like, you know, I don't like his shirt. Or maybe you get the response because of his skin color, it's really dark. And that would be an opportunity for you to respond clearly, smartly, and to refute those notions. You can't tell if Jimmy is a good friend based off his skin color. Maybe Jimmy's a good friend because he's smiling and he looks really nice. 
maybe Jimmy isn't a good friend because you like basketball and maybe he doesn't like basketball. These are examples to make clear distinctions about who would make a good friend based off of character attributes and not physical attributes. This will also be an opportunity to talk about in explicit biases. Pay attention to the symbolism, use the equal sign, talk about equality. Don't be afraid to really dive in and to unpack all of the information that you see directly. Okay, this is our last example. I like the way you guys are doing the work. Look at the images. Don't be distracted by all the playful colors. And now let's look at the language. No little queen, your hair is out of sight. The way your hair grows is perfect and right. It does not matter if it's kinky, coily, or locked real tight. Now let's check out our observations. Hair diversity. As you can see, some of the characters have their hair open, some have it frayed, some have it in an afro, some have it locked. This would be an inviting time to really talk about the history of ethnic hair, of African-American hair. You can talk about hair as a modality of survival and how straight hair has proximity to Western standards of beauty and acceptability and professionalism and how the word professionalism in corporate America sometimes translates to um, Western standards and notions of acceptability. We can talk about how hair in ethnic communities have been policed. We can talk about some current legislation about the Crown Act and how people's bodies are being policed about the way their hair grows naturally and organically. We can also use this as, a as an opportunity to celebrate hair diversity in the way that it can be a form of creative expression in art in history. We could talk about the ancestral act of braiding and how during the transatlantic slave trade, slaves would braid their hair in a form of mapping to navigate from the south to the north to reach freedom. How seeds would often be incorporated in the braids to start a new harvest once they reached a place of freedom. We can always talk about the language that's used to describe ethnic hair. Is it pleasant? Is it positive? Does it have a negative connotation? Don't be afraid to ask questions directly. Have you used words like woolly or dreadlock to describe ethnic hair? If you've, you've, if you've used words like woolly, be mindful that it is a direct correlation to livestock. And it was used as language to affirm the subservient treatment of African-American people and to continue to view them as property during slavery. Also think about the term dreadlocks and how Westerners describe Rastafarian locks as dreadful versus the perception of the Rastafarian people that, that believe their hair represented their faith-based posture and their status. This would be an opportunity to practice how to complement ethnic hair. For example, wow, that hairstyle really brings out your eyes. I really like the creativity of your hairstyle. It would be very inappropriate and intrusive to, in, to voluntarily touch someone's hair or to pet someone's hair. I won't unpack the heaviness of fetishizing black and brown bodies or a dark time in history when African bodies were placed on display in petting zoos for consumption, but I do encourage you guys to research that information independently. The topic can be very heavy and it can be very palatable for young readers, but what's important is for you to navigate where your reader is based on the questions that you're asking and based on their response and to navigate directly. I really hope that this conversation has been helpful and informative. I thank you for your time and your attention. And if you guys wanna keep up with me and have similar conversations, feel free to add me on social media. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lenique um, with Dominique. That was such 
a lot of food for thought in terms of how we approach difficult subjects. Um, <clears throat> I think we have a question already in the chat. Okay. <clears throat> Is it true that inten intentionally not talking about race to your children actually makes issues worse because no matter what you do, they are going to be picking up messaging from the world around them and not talking about it makes it seem like a taboo subject. What are your I thoughts think, on that? <laughs> that is an excellent question and it's a million percent accurate. So we do ourselves and our community a huge injustice by not leaning into conversations that we think are difficult or uncomfortable, particularly when it comes to race. There are so many ways that messages are communicated in our culture. So even if you're not talking about race, um, young readers and young scholars and little ones are already reading the messaging of our culture. They have a very deep knowing of what's considered beautiful, what's not considered beautiful, um, who's preferred, who's not preferred, um, who's treated nicely and gently, and who's not treated nicely and gently. Um, it's, it's all the information that they consume in media, in art, um, in television, et cetera. So that is 100% true. Okay. And you also want to make sure, I'm sorry to chime back in, you also want to make sure that, you know, your values that are positive and your ethos are shared with the people that you care about. So it's really important that your moral compass is being reflected in the conversations that you're having opposed to outside sources that may not honor your value system and may have a toxic or negative influence on the people that you care about. Okay, we have another question. Okay. Um, we got a couple comments too, but how can I show my young sons that black is beautiful? Um, Patricia says she has a five and a two-year-old. Wow, that's a great question. Thank you, Patricia. I think that um, the way that you show them that is by being confident. So you are your kid's first example and being mindful of the type of language that you use to describe yourself. So for example, if you're constantly policing you know, your weight, or if you're constantly critical of your hair, if you're constantly critical of their bodies or their hair, then that's the language and the ideology that they're going to pick up. But if you're constantly affirming yourself and being mindful of the language that you're using, it's kind of contagious. So for example, you know, when your son is running around, you can say, wow, you look really strong and healthy. I like the way you're using your body. Or wow, I like that color shirt on you. It really makes your skin look nice. Or you can just directly say, I really love your skin. It produces melanin and that makes you really special. You know, so don't be afraid to lean into diversity and to be complimentary about that diversity and to use language that's very affirming and to read information that's very affirming as well. So purchasing books that have characters that look like your son or your daughter, um, reading books that positively represent people in your community or outside. So making sure they have exposure to diversity as well. Um, there, I don't see any more questions from the audience, but um, um, tell us a little bit about colorism. A lot of people are still starting just now to hear this terminology and not really understanding what that means. Can you, can you go into that a little bit? Sure, so colorism is, well, it's really heavy. It's very heavy. Um, so essentially it was a tool to fragment communities of color. Oftentimes we think of it exclusively to African-American communities and during slavery, but it's actually a global issue. Lots of communities um, of color experience colorism as a tool that that has its beauty standard based off proximity to whiteness. And the lighter you are was the more preferred treatment that you would get. So for example, in India, they have a caste system. Their colorism, which is like the original, was a pigmentocracy is the actual term um, that was based on your position in society based off the color of your skin. So lighter hued folks would get preferred treatment versus darker hued folks would get harsher and more aggressive treatment. And Western culture is most applicable to African-Americans. 
and it was a tool to divide African Americans um, based on color during slavery. So lighter hued folks were typically indoor slaves and darker hued folks were outdoor slaves. Oftentimes those lighter hued folks um, were offspring of the slave owners. So they would get preferred treatment for that reason as well. So, I mean, it's a very heavy topic um, and those preferred dynamics and preferential treatments still stand out. Um, and those standards of beauty are still relevant today. Especially as we see in the media, in the music videos, in the movies, um, a lot of times we'll see lighter complected, um, you know, women get the parts. And, and, you know, it's unfortunate because, you know, I always say that we always want to be something that we're not. So as a person may look at me and say, oh, you know, you, your ancestors was in the big house or <laughs> they say inappropriate things like which one of your parents is white? Well, both of my parents happen to be black. So <laughs> I'm not sure why you're asking me this question. Yeah, um, I mean, if there's just so many misconceptions about who we are and that we know that black and brown people come in so many different um, shades um, and the colorism not only exists in the African-American community within each other, but also in the Latinx community as well. Um, I have some friends um, and family members who are on the darker complex complexion and they get a lot of shade from, you know, uh, whiter complexion or lighter complexion. On that, on that and absolutely family members it's, and a, stuff. it's a lot of unschooling that we have to do inside and out of our community um the way we've been indoctrinated and socialized about how we think about beauty how we think about skin color and how we think about each other um i mean like you said colorism isn't distinct to african-american it's in the asian community it's in the southeast asian community mm -hmm. it's in the latin x community it's you know it's it has very, very deep toxic roots. Um, and like I said before, it's global and we have to walk very far away from false standards of beauty and be more inclusive and more open about what beauty looks like. So instead of thinking about beauty in the sense that she's prettier than me, like she's here and I'm here, creating mm -hmm. an inferior superior type of relationship, uh, you have to think in a way like she's beautiful and I'm beautiful we're both the same, you know what I mean? And that's the mm -hmm. way we need to have like an open mindset about beauty and color and individuality and diversity as well. Okay, um, let's see. Kristen says that her son is starting to identify and point out people's different attributes, including skin color. I've tried to encourage his observation without devaluing um, any of these observations, but when in public, how would you approach this conversation? So actually those type of observations are very timely. They usually happen about like age two. Kids start to make clear distinctions about color and say, wow, his skin is really dark or wow, her eyes are really blue. And that's totally natural and okay. And I think that you shouldn't be skittish or shy about using that opportunity as a teachable moment. So if your child sees a darker hue person and says, oh my goodness, their skin is really dark wow, that's a really big observation you made. His skin is really dark. It produces melanin. His skin is different, but it does the same thing that your skin does. You know, it protects his bones or it's a part of his body. You know, you really just lean into it. Don't be shy and don't make your kid very hesitant to articulate those observations because they'll draw conclusions independently um, based off the information that they've been processing from outside sources. So even if your kid says something that's really jarring and possibly embarrassing, for example, oh my gosh, his skin is really dark. It looks dirty. I mean, that's really cringeworthy. It would be really good gutting to hear in public, but the reality is kids are, are very transparent and I would lean into that opportunity. That's not a nice thing to say, Jimmy. His skin is dark, but that doesn't mean it's dirty. His skin does the same thing that your skin does. It protects his bones, you know, something like that. So being calm, being clear and refuting those type of comments are really, really valuable and important. 
So don't be shy about <laughs> educating your young one and re-navigating them because they're definitely taking cues and message from the world. So you wanna make sure that you equip, equip them to be um, inclusive, change agents and kind to all people and not just people that look like them. So for the rest of us mere mortals who are adults <laughs> and when we don't have the innocence of a child, right? So how do we um, approach these difficult topics um, oh, wow. like race, like <laughs> racism in America, yes. whether it exists or whether it doesn't exist, how do we approach it? When is it appropriate to have these conversations? Um, when is it appropriate to maybe <laughs> call someone out? When it, I mean, you know, these are all the things that I think. So that I think all... I think you asked a couple of things. So yeah. I don't believe in calling people out because like, to me, that has a negative connotation. So I like to call people up. I like to give them the opportunity to like have a teachable moment. But just for me as a woman and as a black woman and navigating a lot of trauma, um, you know, with a pandemic and racism and, you know, lots of unjustified murders that are public, you know, just navigating all of that and prioritizing my own mental health and peace. I'm very honest about the labor that I choose to take on. Um, so I have, to, I have to ask myself, do I have the bandwidth? You know what I mean? Before I move forward, because that is, that's a ministry, you know, it can be emotional work, it can be academic work, you know, things, information that's reflexive and known to me may be like a lot of deep diving and deep for others. And I may not have the bandwidth. So this is like some of the boxes that I check off. And then I have to ask myself in a conversation, does this person want to learn or does this person want to be right? So like when you're having a conversation with someone, you just got to check in and be like, is this really a teachable moment? Is this person really being present to hearing um, a lived experience from a black woman or are they wanting to be right? Um, so I kind of check those boxes off and then I proceed forward. Um, I think that it's very important to have those teachable moments because sometimes the folks that you're having a dialogue with, they're talking with you um, from a place of confidence and trust. So like some of my closest friends, they don't look like me and they might be asking me something in relation to race or my person, like my lived experience. And I'm not uncomfortable having those intimate and important conversations with them um, and, and deepening our relationship. So that's one perspective. However, if I'm doing a lot of heavy lifting and the person is not teachable, I don't have the bandwidth, not my ministry. <laughs> and, um, Stay in my so lane. <laughs> I, have to, I have to walk away, absolutely. And I have to, I have to walk away. Yeah, I get it. Um, some uncomfortable moments in history going on right now. Um, and I always say, you know, how can we move past this when every time we turn on the television, every time we turn on social media, every time we listen to the radio, the world is reminding us how divided we really are, right? Yeah. How we're divided by party, political party, how we're divided by religion, how we're divided by color, um, economic status, you know. I mean, it's just so much. It's just like the haves and the have nots, the this yeah. and the that. And the, it's just like, God, can we just move forward? Yeah. And so I honestly, think honestly, I think that um, I've always been very. Uh, racially charged. I've been very African-centered. I was reared in a very affirming environment. So these conversations are not foreign to me. I think that, you know, when you look at history and cycles, I think that this has unfortunately been a part of America's history for a very, very long time. Yeah. And I just think that it's being exposed very differently now because we're in the era of information. So we have Facebook, we have social media, we have cell phones, we have body cams. However, the things that we're actually consuming daily were not being introduced to us via this modality. So I think that unfortunately, survivals of the middle passage like you and I have been consuming mm -hmm. trauma for a long time and oh, managing. Yeah. And I think that now our navigation skills and our hurt and our pain are becoming more public. 
So you see more of a public and more of a national type of response. Um, it's something I'm still waiting, you know, waiting through the emotions because it's, it's conversations I've been having for a long time and talking with my friends for a long time. And it's just really disappointing that sometimes it takes body cam footage, you know, to compel them to see things differently. And it's just like, why does the determining factor have to be someone's life, someone's son, you know, someone's brother? I, I wish that, you know, you could be compelled through other, through other methods. Well, those are great words to um, close out on. Um, I love that response. Thank you so much for your honesty. Thank you so much for everything that you've brought to the table today. We certainly have a lot of information um, to share with young readers. Um, and, and we really need to be thoughtful and really mindful of what we say out of our mouths and how we say it and how we approach difficult conversations. So I thank you again. Um, uh, Laniqua Dominique, I hope to bring you back maybe in another capacity. You seem to have a lot of hats, a lot of wisdom, a lot of knowledge, um, but I thank you. And one thing I want to point out, she's from the great Deanwood uh, neighborhood in Washington, D.C., where we have currently the Men of Change exhibition on display at Ron Brown High School. So please check it out. Thank you, guys. We will see you on the 20th, which is the next uh, take time Thursday. We're going to learn about the art of couponing. Miss Matthews <laughs> is taking it to a whole nother level. I'm telling I you. see. I see. Well, thank <laughs> so you for thank your you time and much. inviting me out. I hope to share time and space with you again in any capacity. It's always a joy. Um, oh, and honored right. to be partnering with you guys. Wonderful. You have a very good day. Thank you all for hanging in there with us and have a great afternoon and a lovely weekend coming up. Absolutely. Bye now.